Hello and welcome to Starry Wisdom Sunday. Those of you watching live as well as those of you watching on the replay. That's right. These live streams aren't just for those of you who are here in the flesh. They're for everybody. But you know what? Being here in the flesh is a lot more fun. Yes, it is. Because you can pipe your questions up and get noticed. And if you say something especially funny or witty, you might repeat it. So anyways, thanks to all of you who watch the channel, subscribe to the channel. Whether you prefer the live streams or the produced videos, of course, the produced videos are better. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd make a ton of those if I had more time. I can only do, you know, so many produced stuff, about one a month. Although I will say that um, last month I put out about an hour and a half worth of produced material. The five Nightbringer videos totaled about an hour and a half. So, you know, I'm working hard over here, hardworking dragon. And uh, guys, I got the... I got a whale of a series coming for you at the end of this month called Melisandre's Secrets. And uh, uh, <laughs> old new dude's like, your hair looked better last night. Yeah, it's kind of dry right now. I don't have any, uh, I, don't, I don't have any, it's not all wet and greasy looking, but uh, hopefully I don't offend your eyeballs too much, old new dude. Uh, and thanks for all your great comments, by the way. I've been reading your comments. So, hey guys, um, my camera's doing something kind of funny with the color. I'm a little more red than I should be, but hopefully you guys can deal with it. Anyways, um, last night was a great stream if you missed it. Uh, Quinn from Quinn's Ideas came on. We talked about the curse of the bleeding stars and today, curse of the black swords. These are related ideas, of course. And essentially what we're doing is we're doing a Nightbringer uh, Q&A follow-up. Um, I just decided to sort of characterize last night's Euro-friendly time zone stream more in the image of the uh, bleeding star end of things and today we're going to talk more about cursed swords so make sure you watch the one from last night it was awesome and um uh yeah but i guess what i'm trying to say is you can ask any night bringer questions that you want any long night moon meteor related questions are just fine bring them on um so yeah we're here to discuss all things related to the long night star swords moon meteors all that stuff and I have a super chat in a currency, which I do not recognize. Thank you, Howard. Yes, I am here. Indeed. Quinn was here last night. Again, that was we he was he was here for about an hour and 20 minutes at the beginning of the stream. And I picked his brain on, you know, Lovecraft, uh, cursed blacks, you know, cursed um, you know, like black stones and idols. We talked a lot about the idea of entities and the stars coming to Earth is something that Martin plays with with the others and the Bloodstone Emperor. Um, we got into some pretty cool stuff. Man. We went some great places last night, so that was definitely good. Um, yeah, and, you know, um, the Ask Me, Ask LML about your theory streams, I do one of those a month. So that's what I've been, what I'm doing with that. So we will have one of those this month, definitely. Um, so today, more long night related questions, of course, but... Um, you know, anything related to Azor High, Dawn, any of that stuff is is good. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, thanks everyone for, for joining. And, uh, yeah, thanks to my mods, by the way. My mods doing great. And I want to shout out all of you guys in the crowd just real quick. You guys are awesome. Uh, I'm getting more and more comments lately about people who appreciate the community that we have here. Uh, all the support and uh, just the fr the fun that we have in the chat. Every every live streamer says their chat is great and their crowd is great. But um, I definitely want to tell you guys directly, I appreciate you. Uh, love the crowd that we have here. And when I feel down, you know, sometimes it's those encouraging comments that pick me back up. So I really do appreciate you guys taking the time out to tell me how much you like everything. Blah, 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 blah. Let's talk about a song of ice and fire. Woo. All right. So. You can support the program or send in your questions, paypal.me slash mythicalastronomy. I'm not standing in the center as I usually do today because I realized I'm blocking our beautiful church of starry wisdom. So I figured I'd do that little side angle thing. And uh, of course, if you're watching on your phone and you flip it sideways to get the full screen view, the comments tend to appear on this side of the screen. So I should be, it should be convenient for you guys watching on your phones. So we're going to read some Elric today, guys. Um, and real quickly, I do want to correct something in the video. I implied that Michael Moorcock 
uh, would have been influenced by Tolkien's Anguirel and Anglicel, his twin black meteor swords, uh, when he created Stormbringer and Mornblade. This is not correct because the Silmarillion, which is where we hear of Anglicel and Anguirel, they only that only was printed in the late seventies, and Moorcock actually wrote in the sixties. Moorcock is a, is a total OG. Um, so he, he, in fact, he was not complimentary of Tolkien. He was rather dismissive of Tolkien. Um, and he wrote Elric as a skewering of a lot of fantasy tropes that even back then were already present. Um, so I did some digging last night. Uh, Moorcock, not a fan of Tolkien, as it turns out. So just want to clarify that. Um, but of course, these black swords are part of a greater fantasy trope. And most people th seem to think that Moorcock was influenced by a sword from Norse mythology called Turfing, which we're going to talk about as well. And that's T-Y-R-F-I-N-G, not like astroturfing, but like tierfing, something like that. Tierfing, probably. Um, great work, man. Son Goku says, did the last hero go through the Black Gate? Well, okay, I can talk about the Black Gate. We can start there. That's not a bad idea. So Black Gate, one of the most mysterious things in Song of Ice and Fire. Obviously, this is the, the weirwood face below the knife fort that Bran walks through to get to the north side of the wall, right? So it's a weirwood face, but it moves. It's the only one we've ever seen that moves, and it actually speaks. It's got blind white eyes. Its mouth opens so wide that they can walk through it, and it asks Sam, it listens to Sam's Night's Watch vows, and then lets him enter. Uh, so it is a mysterious thing. The, the main thing I think about the Black Gate is that it predates the wall and predates the night fort. And in fact, the night fort would have been built around the weirwood organism that we know of as the Black Gate, with a little sapling that we find springing up through the courtyard of the, of the night fort, essentially being an outgrowth of that weirwood organism. We know that weirwood, weirwoods live mostly underground. The main part of their mass is underground, very much like a mushroom. And they're, the, the trees are basically like the mushroom caps. They pop them up above the surface, down below is this giant organism. The roots go hundreds of feet deep. Uh, we've seen that in Blood Raven's Cave and elsewhere. We've also seen that the castles of Westeros tend to be built around weirwood trees. Um, that's you were told that Bran the Builder raised the castle around the Winterfell Godswood, and the weirwood trees seem to be eternal. So they can be thousands and thousands or even millions of years old. So Weirwood trees, I don't think they can be planted either. I think that is that is false information. Um, in any case, so the weirwood trees are very old, and the night fort seems to be built around this giant and very unique weirwood organism. Um, and the wall runs right along the night fort. So in my opinion, the weirwood organism was first, then the night fort was built there, and then the wall was built after that. So the night fort wasn't actually the first castle on the wall, in my opinion, but rather predates the wall. Um, and the location of the wall is probably determined by that weirwood organism at the night fort. So I would suspect that the last hero absolutely had something to do with the night fort and that weirwood tree. Um, it could be, could be that that is, has something to do with the knights, king and queen sacrificing their children to the others. Um, you know, some people think, oh, that's where, the, you know, the Night King would have carried his babies north of the wall to give them to the others. I think it's something more magical than that. Night's Queen may very well only exist inside the Weirwood Net. And when we when we read that the uh, Night's King saw Night's Queen north of the wall and chased her and caught her and loved her. Well, north of the wall is often a metaphor for under the sea or inside the Weirwood Net. And so it could very well be that he chased um night's queen inside the weirwood net that is where he caught her and loved her and uh there you go so ah minty with the currency conversion on the super chat in my dock thank you thank you howard for the very generous now that i know how much it is <laughs> uh, paypal appreciate that um so yeah the you know when we knight's king and queen yes i believe the the fact that they are remembered as existing at the night fort where this weirwood organism exists tells me that the weirwood organism is right at the center of all of that. And I really hope we find out uh, about that. All right, so 
Yes, yes. Uh, I see a PayPal dropping in already. Let me grab that by means so I can encourage you guys to send more. Yes, appreciate that. PayPal's, by the way, if you have larger donation, this is a better way to do it. I keep 100% of the proceeds. YouTube takes a little cut of the Super Chats, but either way is appreciated. So Chelsea says, have you given any thought to what the house Dane words could be? Yes, I have. Is it, he is it last hero specific? Is it about the sword Dawn? Does it reference the long night in general? Something else. What are your thoughts? I've created a meme. I have a meme to tell you what the words <laughs> of house Dane are. Question is, can I quickly search for it and find it? The answer is yes. <laughs> I'm so happy that you asked me this question and that I have an answer for you. I don't even have to explain it. I can just put it up on the screen. And there we go. Those are the words of House Dane. Well known. Well known house words. We have Lightbringer, bitch. Yeah. That's it. No, it's got to be something like that. We bring the dawn. It's going to be something that sounds like the Night's nice Watch vows, you know. Uh, keepers of the original ice for House Stark. And of course, I do believe that Dawn was the sword used by the last hero. He would have been a Stark in at least some sense. And that the naming tradition that the Starks carry on of naming their swords ice, even though they're different swords over the years, dates all the way back to the last hero using Dawn, which looks like a big stick of ice. So Dawn is the original ice. And you can find the Dawn is the original ice videos right on my uh, YouTube page. So let's go ahead and read a bit of Elric of Mount Nibine. This is, this is definitely what... <laughs> Moorcock might not have been influenced by Tolkien, uh, but George Martin definitely was influenced by Moorcock and Tolkien. And this scene is where a lot of it starts. So... And one second here. The pulsed cavern, Elric whispered. This is what we should find at the end of the tunnel under the marsh. That must be the entrance, Rakir. It is too small for a man to enter, Elric, said Rakir reasonably. No. Elric stumbled forward until he stood close to the opening. He sheathed his sword. He handed the brand to Rakir, and then, before the warrior priest of Foom could stop him, he had flung himself headfirst through the gap, wriggling his body through, and the walls of the aperture parted for him and then closed behind him, leaving Rakir on the other side. Elric got slowly to his feet. A faint pinkish light now came from the walls, and ahead of him was another entrance, slightly larger than the other through which he had just come. The air was warm and thick and salty. It almost stifled him. His head throbbed and his body ached, and he could barely act or think, save to force himself onward. On faltering legs, he flung himself towards the next entrance as the great muffled pulsing sounded louder and louder in his ears. Elric! Rakir stood behind him, pale and sweating. He had abandoned the brand and followed Elric through. Elric, lick, Elric licked dry lips and tried to speak. Rakir came closer. Elric said thickly, Rakir, you should not be here. I said I would help. Aye, but... Then help I shall. Elric had no strength for arguing, so he nodded, and with his hands forced back the soft walls of the second aperture, and saw that it led into a cavern, whose round wall quivered to a steady pulsing. And in the center of the cavern, hanging in the air without any support at all, were two swords. Two identical swords, huge and fine and black. <clears throat> And standing beneath the swords, his expression gloating and greedy, stood Prince Irkun of Melnibene, reaching up for them, his lips moving, but no words escaping from him. And Elric himself was able to voice but one word as he climbed through and stood upon that shuddering floor. No, he said. Irkun heard the word. He turned with terror in his face. He snarled when he saw Elric, and then he too voiced a word which was at once a scream of outrage. No! With an effort, Elric dragged Albeck's blade, that's the sword he's carrying uh, right now, from its scabbard, but it seemed too heavy to hold upright. It tugged his arms so that it rested on the floor, his arm hanging straight at his side. Elric drew deep breaths of heavy air into his lungs. His, vi his vision was dimming. 
Irkun became a shadow. Only the two black swords, standing still and cool in the very center of the circular chamber, were in focus. Elric sensed Rekir enter the chamber and stand beside him. Irkun, said Elric at last, those swords are mine. Irkun smiled and reached up towards the blades. A peculiar moaning sound seemed to issue from them. A faint black radiance seemed to emanate from them. Elric saw the runes carved into them, and he was afraid. Rekir fitted an arrow to his bow. He drew the string back to his shoulder, sighting along the arrow at Prince Irkun. If he must die, Elric, tell me. Slay him, said Elric, and Rakir released the string. But the arrow moved very slowly through the air and then hung halfway between the archer and his intended target. Irkun turned, a ghastly grin on his face. Mortal weapons are useless here, he said. Elric said to Rakir, he must be right, and your life is in danger, Rakir. Go. Rakir gave him a puzzled look. No, I must stay here and help you. Elric shook his head. You cannot help. You will only die if you stay. Go. Reluctantly, the red archer unstrung his bow, glanced suspiciously at the two black swords, then squeezed his way through the doorway and was gone. Now, Irkun, said Elric, letting Albeck's sword fall to the floor. We must settle this, you and I. And then the rune blades, Stormbringer and Mournblade, were gone from where they had hung so long. And Stormbringer had settled into Elric's right hand, and Mournblade lay in Prince Irkun's right hand. And the two men stood on opposite sides of the pulsing cavern and regarded each other and the swords they held. The swords were singing. Their voices were faint, but could be heard quite plainly. Elric lifted the huge blade easily and turned it this way and that, admiring its alien beauty. Stormbringer, he said, and then he felt afraid. It was suddenly as if he had been born again and that this rune sword was born with him. It was as if they had never been separate. Stormbringer. And the sword moaned sweetly and settled even more smoothly into his grasp. Stormbringer! yelled Eric, Elric, and he leapt at his cousin. Stormbringer! And he was full of fear, so full of fear. And the fear brought a wild kind of delight, a demonic need to fight and kill his cousin, to sink the blade deep into Irkun's heart, to take vengeance, to spill blood, to send a soul to hell. And now Prince Irkun's cry could be heard above the thrum of the sword voices, the drumming of the pulse of the cavern. Mornblade! And Mornblade came up to meet Stormbringer's blow and turned that blow and thrust back at Elric, who swayed aside and brought Stormbringer round and down in a side stroke, which knocked Irkun and Mornblade backward for an instant. But Stormbringer's next thrust was met again, and the next thrust was met, and the next. If the swordsmen were evenly matched, then so were the blades, which seemed possessed of their own wills, though they performed the wills of their wielders. And the clang of the metal upon metal turned into a wild, metallic song which the swords sang, a joyful song as if they were glad at last to be back to battling, though they battled each other. And Elric barely saw his cousin, Prince Yerkun, at all, save for the occasional flash of his dark, wild face. Elric's attention was given entirely to the two black swords, for it seemed that the swords fought with a life of one of the other swordsmen as a prize, or perhaps the lives of both, thought Elric, and that the rivalry between Elric and Yerkun was nothing compared to the brotherly rivalry between the swords, who seemed full of pleasure at the chance to engage again after many millennia. And this observation, as he fought, and fought for his soul as well as his life, gave Elric pause to consider his hatred of Yerkun. Kill Yerkun he would, but not at the will of another power not to give sport to these alien swords. Mornblade's point darted at his eyes and Stormbringer rose to deflect the thrust once more. Elric no longer fought his cousin. He fought the will of the two black swords. Stormbringer dashed for Irkun's momentarily undefended throat. Elric clung to the sword and dragged it back, sparing his cousin's life. Stormbringer whined almost petulantly like a dog stopped from biting an intruder. And Elric spoke through clenched teeth, I'll not be your puppet, Runeblade. If we must be united, let it be upon a proper understanding. The sword seemed to hesitate, to drop its guard, and Elric was hard put to defend himself against the whirling attack of Mornblade, which, in turn, seemed to sense its advantage. Elric felt fresh energy pour up his right arm and into his body. 
This was what the sword could do. With it, he needed no drugs, would never be weak again. In battle, he would triumph. At peace, he could rule with pride. When he traveled, it could be alone and without fear. It was as if the sword reminded him of all these things, even as it returned Mornblade's attack. And what must the sword have in return? Elric knew. The sword told him without any words of any sort. Stormbringer needed to fight, for that was its reason for existence. Stormbringer needed to kill, for that was the source of its energy, the lives and the souls of men, demons, even gods. And Elric hesitated, even as his cousin gave a huge cackling yell and dashed at him so that Mornblade glanced off his helm and he was flung backwards and down and saw Irkun gripping his moaning black sword in both hands to plunge the rune blade into Elric's body. And Elric knew he would do anything to resist that fate, for his soul to be drawn into Mornblade and his strength to feed Prince Irkun's strength. And he rolled aside very quickly and got to one knee and turned and lifted Stormbringer with one gauntleted hand upon the blade and the other upon the hilt to take the great blow Prince Irkun brought upon it. And the two black swords shrieked as if in pain, and they shivered, and black radiance poured from them as blood might pour from a man pierced by many arrows. And Elric was driven, still on his knees, away from the radiance, gasping and sighing and peering here and there for sight of Irkun, who had disappeared. And Elric knew that Stormbringer spoke to him again. If Elric did not wish to die by Mornblade, then Elric must accept the bargain which the Black Sword offered. He must not die, said Elric. I will not slay him to make sport for you. And through the Black Radiance ran Irkun, snarling and snapping and whirling his rune sword. Again, Stormbringer darted through an opening, and again Elric made the blade pull back, and Irkun was only grazed. Stormbringer writhed in Elric's hands. Elric said, you shall not be my master. And Stormbringer seemed to understand and become quieter as if reconciled. And Elric laughed, thinking that he now controlled the rune sword and that from now on the blade would do his bidding. We shall disarm Irkun, said Elric. We shall not kill him. Elric rose to his feet. Stormbringer moved with all the speed of a needle-thin rapier. It fainted, it parried, it thrust. Irkun, who had been grinning in triumph, snarled and staggered back, the grin dropping from his sullen features. Stormbringer now worked for Elric. It made the moves that Elric wished to make. Both Irkun and Mornblade seemed disconcerted by this turn of events. Mornblade shouted as if in astonishment at his brother's behavior, at its brother's behavior. Elric struck at Irkun's sword arm, pierced cloth, pierced flesh, pierced sinew, pierced bone. Blood came, soaking Irkun's arm and dripping down onto the hilt of the sword. The blood was slippery. It weakened Irkun's grip on his rune sword. He took it in both hands, but he was unable to hold it firmly. Elric, too, took Stormbringer in both hands. Unearthly strength surged through him. With a gigantic blow, he dashed Stormbringer against Mornblade where the blade met hilt. The rune sword flew from Irkun's grasp. It sped across the pulsing cavern. Elric smiled. He had defeated his own sword's will and in turn had defeated the brother sword. Mornblade fell against the wall of the pulsing cavern and for a moment was still. A groan then seemed to escape the defeated rune sword. A high-pitched shriek filled the pulsing cavern. Blackness flooded over the eerie pink light and extinguished it. When the light returned, Elric saw that a scabbard lay at his feet. The scabbard was black and of the same alien craftsmanship as the rune sword. Elric saw Irkun. The prince was on his knees and he was sobbing, his eyes darting about the pulsing cavern, seeking Mornblade, looking at Elric with fright as if he knew he must be slain. Mornblade, Hercoon said hopelessly. He knew he was to die. Mornblade had vanished from the pulsing cavern. Your sword is gone, said Elric quietly. Irkun whimpered and tried to crawl towards the entrance of the cavern, but the entrance had shrunk to the size of a small coin. Irkun wept. Stormbringer trembled as if thirsty for Irkun's soul. Elric stooped. Irkun began to speak rapidly. Do not slay me, Elric. Not with that rune blade. I will do anything you wish. I will die in any other way. Elric said, We are the victims, cousin, of a conspiracy. A game played by gods, demons, and sentient swords. They wish one of us dead. I suspect they wish you dead more than they wish me dead. And that is the reason why I shall not slay you here. He picked up the scabbard. 
He forced Stormbringer into it, and at once the sword was quiet. Elric took off his old scabbard and looked around for Aubeck's sword, but that too was gone. He dropped the old scabbard and hooked the new one on his belt. He rested his left hand upon the pommel of Stormbringer, and he looked not without sympathy upon the creature that was his cousin. You are a worm, Irkun. But is that your fault? Irkun gave him a puzzled glance. I wonder, if you had all you desire, would you cease to be a worm, cousin? Irkun raised himself to his knees. A little hope began to show in his eyes. Elric smiled and drew a deep breath. We shall see, he said. You must agree to wake Cimmeril from her sorcerous slumber. You have humbled me, Elric, said Irkun in a small pitiful voice. I will wake her, or would. Can you not undo your spell? We cannot escape from the pulsing cavern. It is past the time. What's this? I did not think you would follow me, and then I thought I would easily finish you, and now it is past the time. One can keep the entrance open only for a little while. It will admit anyone who cares to enter the pulsing cavern, but it will not. It will let no one out after the power of the spell dies. I gave much to know that spell. You have given too much for everything, said Elric. He went to the entrance and peered through. Rakir waited on the other side. The Red Archer had an anxious expression. Elric said, Warrior Priest of Foom, it seems that my cousin and I are trapped in here. The entrance will not part for us. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, and it says, Oh, it is not much of a fate if I go back, said Rakir. What chances have you? One, said Elric. I can invoke my patron. A Lord of Chaos? Rakir made a wry face. Exactly, said Elric. I speak of Ariok. Ariok, eh? Well, he does not care for renegades from Foom. And Ariok, by the way, is a terrible demon. He is nobody to mess with, but he is the patron of Melnibene and Elric. So it's very much just as he is bound to this evil sword, he's also bound to this Lord of Chaos, Ariok. So skipping ahead a tiny bit to where he summons Ariok, it says... Him and Rek here have a little banter. Let's see. He adjust Elric turned his back on Rakir and on Irkun. He adjusted his mind. He sent it out through vast spaces and complicated mazes, and he cried, Ariok, Ariok, aid me, Ariok. He had a sense of something listening to him. Ariok. Something shifted in the places where his mind went. Ariok. And Ariok heard him. He knew it was Ariok. Rakir gave a horrified yell. Irkun screamed. Elric turned and saw that something disgusting had appeared near the far wall. It was black and it was foul and it slobbered and its shape was intolerably alien. It's very Lovecraftian description there. Was this Ariok? How could it be? Ariok was beautiful, but perhaps, thought Eric, Elric, this was Ariok's true shape. Upon this plane and this peculiar cavern, Ariok could not deceive those who looked upon him. But then the shape had disappeared and a beautiful youth with ancient eyes, stood looking at the three mortals. And that's how he usually appears. You have won the sword, Elric, said Ariok, ignoring the others. I congratulate you. And you have spared your cousin's life. Why so? More than one reason, said Elric. But let us say he must remain alive in order to wake Cimmeril. Ariok's face bore a little secret smile for a moment, and Elric realized that he had avoided a trap. If he had killed Irkun, Cimmeril would never have woken again. So there you go. Oh, I hope you enjoying the pulsing cavern and the sword play. So that's a little taste of Elric of Melnibene uh, by Michael Moorcock. Very exciting scene. Magical duel. Uh, this is in this, this pulsing cavern is in a completely different like realm. It's on some astral plane or something. It's not even really a physical place. Uh, which is common in Elric's stories. They frequently journey into other dimensions and things. Um, so pretty cool here, mystical sword duel. And really the, the interesting thing here is you see the curse of the sword present as soon as he picks it up. It's This is the origin, if you will, of the idea of these swords that want to drink blood. They want to, well, I won't say the origin. There's There's something else I want to talk about from Japanese mythology as well. But you get major Valerian steel vibes here, right? You know, Oathkeeper was alive in Brienne's hand, and that's a common description of the Valerian steel swords when people are wielding them. You know, George is not going quite so far as to make them as sentient as Stormbringer here. 
However, it does say that Lightbringer drank Nissa Nissa's soul and blood and strength and courage, right? So that is very similar to Stormbringer drinking souls when it kills people. And by the way, you only need to get scratched by Stormbringer and it can kill you and drink your soul. So um, yeah, it's deadly. Um, guys, let me get Cleo. One second. Let me give you some Elric art to look at. And then I will go get Cleo so she can stop screaming and I can stop worrying about it. When she screams, yes, 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 I know. This is by Odinoir. And let me just share this. Fuck it, Cleo. All right. Can't do anything around here without Cleo. Those are the rules. So you see a very cool picture of Elric here. Let me pull up a couple others. Elric is basically a demon once he takes hold of Stormbringer. He slays demons, but he himself is a demon. And uh, th there's a bloodlust that comes upon Elric when he pulls out Stormbringer, you see it in this scene a little bit where he was talking about, you know, the sword is wanting to, to spill your coon's blood, but it's even worse when there's like a whole group of foes. Elric completely disappears into a red haze and just wakes up and everyone's dead. Kind of um, it's, it's terrifying. It's uh, overwhelming. He can't be stopped with Stormbringer uh, basically at all. So the thing is that Elric, like I was saying, he's weakened. He he relies on drugs uh, to stay alive. So Stormbringer is replacing uh, those drugs with they're filling him with sorcerous power. So Elric very quickly becomes faithfully joined with the sword in a way that he can't you can't really afford to get rid of it because he'll be he'll be uh yeah and Amanda Rake absolutely is a <laughs> is a big um you know from a uh he's he's definitely inspired by elric like a thousand percent you could tell if you've ever read that series by uh steven erickson uh but yeah let me share some more elric pictures real quick because the elric art is friggin awesome so this one's by bjorn lensig of course, if you saw the cover art of this uh, stream, you saw Elric is sits on a throne. It's called the Ruby Throne, and it does have some similarities to the Iron Throne. It's huge and uh, kind of spiky. You know, it's it's red ruby instead of black iron. But I definitely think that was part of the uh, inspiration. You can see the rune blade here, black and red. It's always got that eye on the hilt. It turns out that uh, these these rune swords are not just swords, actually. They're actually demons. They're demons that take the form of swords so that they can drink blood. And at the very end of this story, spoilers for Elric of Melanibene, the sword turns back into a demon and kills Elric and laughs and like flies away into the sky. So the swords are evil. They're 100% evil. And there's, they find out eventually that there's actually hundreds of demons who all took the form of swords. And even though it's only Stormbringer and Mournblade who play an important role, there are some points when we see a whole bunch of other swords, um, you know, like these. So these are, these are all demons taking the form of a sword. Instead of a dragon sword, it's a demon sword. And this one is by David Jennison. Totally cool. You can see the black radiance coming from the blade there. 
This one is by Stephen Gabrielle and it's a very Targaryen looking Elric. So pretty cool. Elric's been out for 60 years, so spoilers. This is the one I used um, on the cover art by Gary Jamraz Palma. And this is probably my favorite Elric art. I mean, just friggin' look at that. That is the man right there. It's King Blood Raven with Lightbringer. He's basically Elric is a mashup of Blood Raven and Azor High. Uh, when we think of like a Song of Ice and Fire, that's that's those are the two characters that that uh, he's contributing the most to. Cleo, will you let me put you on the tree? You be okay right there, girl? Or are you going to freak out and have a tantrum? We shall see. Uh, another very Targaryen-looking Elric here. He's got the rune sword, a little bit of flame. He's kind of emaciated and thin, but he's also like a deadly warrior when he starts fighting, so... <clears throat> that's why he's always looking kind of like, well, emaciated and pale. That's 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 the whole Elric dichotomy, I guess. This is from the actual comic. This is that scene we just read where the blades are settling into each other's hands. You see Mornblade and Stormbringer, the one where they're here, they're clashing now. So use those in the video. Here's another great one. This is like very warrior blood raven looking. Whoops, sorry. Sorry, guys. This is by Israelona. <clears throat> Super goth looking. Then we have these two by Brahm. Bane of the Black Sword is one of the Elric books. That's where I took the Curse of the Black Sword title from, an Elric title. So this one, you can see all the souls around Stormbringer. And you can see the sort of Valerian steel look to it. And... There's one more by the same artist, Brahm, right here. So this is an older Elric. Um, one of the cool things about Elric is like he's a little bit of not quite all the way to gender bending, but he's definitely got that sort of effeminate Targaryen thing going on that you can see George replicates when he says some of the Targaryen men are as beautiful as women, stuff like that. Um, the Melnibonaeans are absolutely like Valerians. They're they're kind of like half elven. They're not exactly normal humans. They're special humans. And Valeria is like such a direct copy of Melanibene. It's not even funny. And then we have these two by John or three by John Picaccio, well known a Song of Ice and Fire artist. These are for uh, covers of newer Elric works. Actually, this is the cover for Stealer of Souls. This one is the cover for Swords and Roses. And this one is The Sleeping Sorceress. So there you go. We're Elricking it up. Um, so are the books good? It's, it's yes, but um, some of them are some of the very earliest writings of Moorcock. And the pacing is like very quick. It's almost like a comic. It's very light. Things move happen really fast. Um, some of the later books, it slows down, feels more like a fantasy novel. So definitely worth reading. Um, uh, I have, I've read like four different Elric books. The, they were released out of order chrono uh, of the chronology of the internal world. So the fifth book is like the second in order and people there's different orders you can read them in and stuff. So you can kind of just dive into it anywhere really. And just sort of get the vibe of it. I feel like Elric is more of a, a feel thing than it is a plot thing. Um, obviously it has a plot and stuff, but like the main thing that has inspired so many fantasy writers and Elric is hugely influential is the feel of like the scene that I just read. Um, the concept of a king who doesn't want to sit on his throne, who thinks his whole empire might be not even worthy of existing. And so Elric abandons the throne. He abdicates it. He leaves it to his cousin Irkun, actually, after humbling him. 
And he goes on a journey for like a year or more out into the lands as like sort of just a wandering, you know, Odin like traveler. It's sort of learning about things and stuff. So he's very cerebral. And it's also where this, this sort of idea of these bookish Targaryens come from. Uh, there's another passage I might read later, depending on how much time we have. It's the beginning of Elric of Melnibene. And you can see sitting on the throne, sort of just pondering Melnibene and the nature of the empire. And he's seen as an un Melnibenean emperor. Um, he's not arrogant like Irkun. Irkun is arrogant and proud and showy. And that is what the Melnibeneans expect in an emperor. And so Elric being bookish and thoughtful and withdrawn, a lot of people are uncertain about his rule when he takes the throne. Um, and Irkun basically is constantly challenging him uh, as being not a real Melnibenean and not worthy of the throne. So that's kind of the dynamic of that. And I, I find that all very interesting because I'm going to write about, of course, Atlantis or pseudo Atlantis in my own fiction. So is Elric good or bad? He's the ultimate anti-hero. He is squarely in the middle. Um, you know, he's trying to do the right thing sometimes, but not all, other times not. He definitely is cruel. He, um, not not as cruel as the Melnibeneans, who are very cruel, but he's uh, definitely kills a lot of people. He sometimes accidentally kills his friends. I mean, he's carrying around a demon blade. Um, so he's kind of in the middle. There's, the, the Melnibenean universe is, uh, or Moorcock's universe, he, he actually was one of the first people that wrote a, a multiverse and came up with that term multiverse or used it. Um, what was I saying? Uh, it's it's divided into the forces of law and chaos. So like order and chaos. And uh, Moorcock is actually an anarchist politically. So he often is sort of chafing against any sort of structure or master. And ultimately, I think Elric choosing to be his own master and not follow the ways of Melnibene is meant to be seen as a heroic thing, but he's a very tragic figure as well. So, you know, he's not a bad guy, but he's definitely morally gray for sure. And of course he accidentally kills Cimmeril, his love at the climax of the story that we were just reading, essentially. Um, he's fighting with Yerkun, um, and Cimmeril is there because Yerkun has, has kidnapped Cimmeril. And Stormbringer, which, as you saw, has a mind of its own, basically kills Cimmeril while in Elric's hands. Yerkun sort of dodges out of the way suddenly, and it's tragic and accidental. He doesn't slay Cimmeril on purpose like Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa, but it's definitely the inspiration for the Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa myth in part. Um, and I've got a great piece of art with Cimmeril and Elric. I've got two pieces, actually. We are going to talk about things other than Elric, by the way. But this is, uh, I've been waiting to uh, unleash some of this stuff. So here we go. Hope you're enjoying it. we got 200 people watching. Click the like button, people. Thank you very much. This is called The Death of Cimmeril. And I used this in the video, of course, the Nightbringer video by Mobius Traveler. And we're going to have to zoom in because this says like it's crazy busy. There we go. So up here we see, I don't know if this is like a god or if this is just a depiction of Cimmeril, but down here is Elric. And then you could see here is Cimmeril's, you know, the physical Cimmeril being struck with the sword. And there's portals opening up and there's magic happening. And the sword's on fire. And it looks a lot like Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa, doesn't it? So... Again, I'm not sure what the, the face up top is, is supposed to be. Perhaps that's Cimmeril's soul going into Stormbringer. That's what I would guess. By the power of Grayskull, yeah. Talk about He-Man and Thundar. There's some Marvel Comics influences on Lightbringer as well. Um, so Lightbringer is not something George just pulled out of his pocket, <laughs> if you will. Oh, I've got one more Cimmeril, sorry. Lightbringer is following in a grand tradition of magic swords, most of which are evil and cursed. This is by uh, I Gujin. I Gujin I. 
obviously got a more anime style here. So you can see the dragons. And Melnibene is a dragon lord civilization, by the way, in case you didn't know. <clears throat> I think I've been flying by some super chats here. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's get these. I do have these all in a doc, thanks to Minty, so I won't miss any. Elric and Stormringer are also influenced by Kalervo from Finnish myth. Kalervo speaks to his sword before he falls on it. Ah, yes, totally. That's a good call. Um, and we see that with uh, Turin and Beleg, too. Um, <clears throat> uh, Turin, so I mentioned uh, Angrel, right? And Gurthang and Anglikel. Turin, um, when he uses the black sword to accidentally kill his friend, he is... Uh, he is consumed by by grief, and he he has the sword reforged into Gurthang and fights, and he kills the dragon, does all this stuff, but he still ends up wanting to kill himself at the end of it through a great series of tragedies. And the sword, Gurthang, he asks it, will you drink my blood? And Gurthang's like, gladly, yes. And then he falls upon his sword. So definitely Kalervo is the influence on Tolkien and probably Moorcock as well. It's a good call. Very good call. And then we had another super chat from... We got two more. From Anu Aurora, just a, a $10, thank you. And here's one El, uh, from uh, Anu again. Elric entering a killing frenzy is like... Is that Ku Chulane? Kuchulain, an Irish myth, entering a killing frenzy. Will we see a killing frenzy from a cursed sword in a Game of Thrones? Well, yes. We already have. Or at least we saw the beginning of it. So remember in the Odin John video, I talked about how Jon Snow frequently has the... Uh, actually, I'll leave that comment up. He does have a berserker fury. And I compared it to the Ulv Hednar and the berserkers of Viking mythology. Because, of course, Jon is a wolf warrior with a, a bear sword. So... A bear sword turned wolf sword. Um, there's three different scenes where John's anger gives him extra adrenaline and he kind of blacks out. Um, the most notable one is when he's fighting with uh, um, the wildling who became sword's master, uh, Leathers. And he um, starts thinking about Rob calling him names as a kid and he like blacks out. He comes to and everyone's like, John! stop and leathers is like i i said yield bro <laughs> so it's like definitely going to be john that potentially could go into a killing frenzy um either with long claw or with some other sword that he gets good question and uh oh i might have to reboil my tea i think i boiled it and then it went off and i forgot i'm gonna grab my honey too Need my honey. Super quick. One second, guys. <clears throat> Always buy local honey. It's good for your allergies, of course. Not breaking any news there, but in case you didn't know. So. Cursed swords. You can see, like... So Valerian Steel is, again, George doesn't put as much writing effort into portraying the Valerian swords as being sentient. But he's definitely playing with this idea. He's telling us Lightbringer drank Nyssa's soul. Then he's strongly implying that Valerian swords are made with blood magic and human sacrifice, which would indicate that they are probably cursed with the same kind of dark magic. Um, Oh, I see people mentioning the runes. George is playing with runes a lot, isn't he? He's got the runic armor and the first men used runes. We haven't seen runes on a sword yet, but that could happen. And that would be a cool... Uh... So no, the, I don't think the Andals were there before the Long Night. I know some people have that theory. I addressed that in a stream called Timeline Heresies, The Pact and the Hammer of the Waters. I uh, strongly disagree with that one. And I think all the evidence for it is, is misunderstood. The first men did have iron. They just only had crude iron and not steel. The Andals brought steel. That's what they had, which is much different than crude iron that you make like horseshoes with. 
<clears throat> okay. Also, we got those iron swords in the crypts of the Starks and the Iron Islands, which have been named that because they uh, have iron on them. Also, the Andals aren't important. They're just scenery. They're a part of the world building. They're not important at all. They don't figure into any of the magic, and they're not going to be part of the end game. It's just part of the history of Westeros. That's George dealing with like multiple ways of conquest and stuff like that. It's good history, but it's not part of the magical plot in any sense, in my opinion. Screw the Andals. All right. <clears throat> Do the Valerians have swords? Not that we know of, but it seems like they should. Oh, there are runes on the dragon horn. Totally. Thank you, Mike. And there, the runes are carved into the Valerian steel. And of course, Euron's uh, suit of armor also has Valerian glyphs and runes in it. So there you go. The Valerians did use rune magic. Very cool. Uh, there's a cursed ebony blade of the Black Knight from Marvel. Isn't the Black Knight, that's Dane Whitman, right? The guy that Jon Snow is going to play? Yeah, people have definitely mentioned that to me. The blade itself incites to deeds of violence. Exactly. So there's... um. There's a, a Japanese type of sword made by a, and this is, and this is real life we're talking here. Um, let me just pull up a thing from my history so I can find it. I don't want to say the word wrong. <clears throat> Let's see. Muramasa. Okay, so... In the 1500s, of course, samurai swords in Japan are very high quality things. And, I'll, and um, the sword makers were as famous as the famous swordsmen. And there was one called Muramasa, very famous. He started a school of sword making. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, not Hattori Hanzo. <laughs> the Muramasa swords eventually became, they uh, gained the reputation of being cursed. Because Muramasa was, um, well, there's a bunch of rumors about him. He was either very cantankerous and angry and, and prone to fits of rage, or he might have been actually crazy. Um, but he was very unstable and violent, but he was a brilliant bladesmith. This is, the, this is the story. And so eventually people began to say that his, his rage and his wildness and his temper cursed the blades and so the stories began to be um to crop up around these muramasa blades being involved in all these very famous tragic incidents where people kill their loved ones and it was said about the blades just like elric i mean it's the same shit if the sword comes out it has to drink blood and we see um we see lionel corbray say that about lady forlorn oh when she comes out she has to have a drink and it's just kind of a saying but it's, a, it's true about Stormbringer, and it's true about these Muramasa swords, or at least that's what it was said, that if, if they were drawn, they had to drink blood. And if there was no opponent, then you would have to feed it your own blood. So it's very much a Faustian bargain to have one of these swords. And eventually, this belief became so enmeshed that an emperor, there was one of the emperors, I forget his name, he outlawed the swords and started having them destroyed. Um, and it became believed that these swords had it out for this one dynasty in particular. Um, and then uh, the rivals of that dynasty then wanted those blades because they were, you know, for obvious reasons. So then the fakes began to pop up. And so now it's hard to tell if Muramasa, if any Muramasa sword is, is accurate or not, is real or not. But it's a very famous thing. Like if you type in cursed swords in YouTube, this is the first thing that comes up. So... Decent chance that George has heard of the Muramasa swords and was thinking of them. They're also called demon blades. Um, 
possible that that uh Moorcock was influenced by this as well. It really does sound a lot like Stormbringer, so <clears throat> uh yeah, I will uh I watched a cool video about it and I will share that one. It's from Beyond Science. And I thought it was really cool, so I could definitely share that with you. Post it in the comments there. Now, um, I, oops, sorry, guys. Bump the mic. Strongly recommend, if you guys are interested in this whole Magic Sword talk, you should definitely watch the Brienne stream that I did last week. Um, it was a Brienne Feast for Crows chapter. It's the Nimble Dick chapter where Brienne uses Earth uh, Oathkeeper. Oh. Downtown Clowny Brown is saying that Muramasa is actually in Marvel. Oh, well, then he's definitely heard of it if it's in Marvel. Cool. Well, I'm glad all that stitches together then because I was watching this Muramasa video like, God damn, this, this sounds a lot like what we're talking about. So that's cool. Thank you for that. I'm ha very happy to know that that meets up behind the scenes. So I was just saying, um, make sure you watch the Brienne stream because we talked about Oathkeeper and Cursed Swords quite a bit. Galadon of Morn stories in that chapter. Um, so there's there's a lot of sword discussion going on. Thank you, Carl Karsnark. And as I said there, I think the idea of the cursed sword comes from the nature of swords themselves. Like swords are only for killing. It's not like an ax where you can also cut down a tree. Swords only purpose is to take human lives. Um, so in a fantasy world, we're just sort of taking that idea and trumping it up with magic and saying, well, the, the best swords are the most cursed. They're the most evil, you know? Um, yeah, not every fantasy sword is cursed. Narsil isn't cursed, uh, but a lot of them are. And there's a cool Moorcock quote about this, which I found insightful. Where is that quote? Oh, yes. It's very short. It says, Moorcock intended the sword as a symbol of his theme, how mankind's wish fantasies can bring about the destruction of part of mankind. So there you go. It's, it's about reaching too high. It's about wish fulfillment without responsibility, if you will. So lust for power that kind of thing. Um, that's, you know, the, the idea of battle glory. Where's my tab? There we go. So yes, I do think all Valerian blades are potentially cursed. Um, yeah. And light, Lightbringer more than, more than all of them. So <clears throat> wherever, wherever Lightbringer is and whatever it is. Nimble Dick's brother is not named Limber Wiener. That's Nimble Dick's other nickname, clearly. Hey, good girl. You're being very good, Cleo. Thank you. So um, the Muramasa sword in particular reminds me of the story of Eol, the dark elf, who forged Anglicel and Anguirel, the, the two black meteor swords, because it was Eol's malice it was Eol's character flaws that made the swords cursed, okay? And so this is very similar to the Muramasa sword. Now, Turfing, which is the sword that most people seem to think Moorcock was thinking of. It is the sword, let's see here. It's featured in the Turfing cycle. It gets carried by a lot of people with very unpronounceable names. <laughs> but the main thing I want to tell you is that Odin's grandson is the guy, uh, he was, I can't, these names are so terrible. He he manages to trap two dwarves, Dvalin and Durin. Durin is like the original dwarf name, apparently. <clears throat> of course, Tolkien used it. 
Um, he traps these two dwarves when they leave a rock that they dwell. He forces them to forge a sword with a golden hilt that would never miss a stroke, would never rust, and would cut through stone and iron as easily as through clothes. The dwarves made the sword, and it shone and gleamed like fire. However, in revenge, they cursed it so that it would kill a man every time it was drawn, and that it would be the cause of three great evils. They finally cursed it so that it would also kill this guy who wanted the sword himself. So we got a couple familiar ideas here. The sword has to kill when it comes out. All right. And it's associated with three evil deeds. Sounds a little bit like the undying prophecy of Daenerys, like three treasons will you know, three fires will you light. Kind of sounds a little bit like that. So turfing. And I'm not going to go through all the, the stories associated with it, but it's associated with a bunch of cursed incidents, people accidentally killing the people they don't want to kill, taking their own lives, same kind of stuff. So, oh, cool. There's a turfing video from Jackson Crawford. Yeah, I should have watched that. Should have watched that. Thank you, Mr. Karsnark. And the moral of the story, you never uh, make people work against their own will. Pay attention, you capitalist CEOs. You don't get very good quality of work when you have unhappy workers. So that's where that curse came from. So guys, I will just remind you that we are taking questions on anything having to do with Lightbringer, Black Swords, or Nightbringer. I know I went pretty specific there with a bunch of Elric and stuff, but we definitely can take questions on anything related to what was in the Nightbringer videos or the Long Night, any of that stuff. Sebastian with a PayPal for the Garth Jar. Thank you, Sebastian. Is it 420 yet? 15 minutes away. All right. Cool, guys. So we've got this idea that <clears throat> the Valerian steel swords are cursed and evil, but we might need to use them against the others, right? And the others themselves seem to be cursed and evil or maybe misunderstood, but definitely have alien magic, let's say, and want to kill humans. So from the perspective of a human being, definitely evil. Obviously there's, Actually, we talked last night about the fact that the others may have raised the wall to keep the nasty humans away, since the others are so very delicate and fragile, if you have a piece of dragon glass in your hand. So check that out if you want that kind of talk. But the idea that Martin is showing us is that we've got to pit these two monstrous things against each other. Um, so he's 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 sort of creating these evil weapons, but he's also saying that we need them. So it's definitely kind of morally ambiguous, if you will. So let's um let's talk about the names of the Valerian steel swords because I did tease in the uh oh I see there's one super chat that I missed from Timmy. Then we're gonna go through the Valerian steel sword names and talk about how all the names describe the long night symbolism. But Timmy says what would you be the most sad about if it stays unexplained? Um, Lightbringer, probably. Like if we never see the original Lightbringer and if Dawn doesn't get wielded in battle and we don't know what the original Lightbringer was, that would be disappointing. I don't think that'll happen, of course, but... <clears throat> Do I think that Widow's Whale could be used in a Lightbringer forging scene? Well, Widow's Whale is like chilling in King's Landing, I think. It hasn't been seen in a while. Oathkeeper is the one that I've got my eyes on because Oathkeeper is in Lady Stoneheart's cave. And Lady Stoneheart is running on R'hllor power. And she has a stone heart. So if Jamie or Brienne were to stab her with Oathkeeper, the R'hllor power inside of her should light the sword on fire just as Beric let his sword on fire with his R'hllor blood. So then you'd have a Nissa Nissa forging ritual that actually would light the sword on fire, and it would be like a weird 
sword and the stone thing, wouldn't it? Because she's stone heart. So if you pulled a flaming sword out of her heart, you would be like King Arthur and Excalibur uh, and the sword and the stone, wouldn't it? And of course, Excalibur is another Lightbringer influence. Excalibur, um, it's not known to be a flaming sword, but it shines blindingly bright with light. So same idea. And it's also excep exceptionally light. Um, Excalibur was forged in dragon fire as well by Merlin. So that's another Valerian steel influence. Eol, the dark elf, created black steel, which was unbreakable. Uh, we see that Melnibene is using these black swords. And there's more sort of weird metal craftsmanship from the people that's made those. And then there's also... Uh, Uh, what was I just thinking of? Shit. Sorry, I have ADD. Sometimes things fly out of my brain. Uh, well, yeah, just the idea that Excalibur was forged in dragon fire. So you can see where the, the where the uh, Valerian steel comes from. It comes from several places, but. So Widow's Whale is last seen in King's Landing, I believe, right? I don't think Jamie's wearing it. I don't think Jamie brought it with him. Although we certainly could get his hands on it, which would be cool because then you'd have Jamie and Brienne with the matching swords, just like Jamie's dream where they, he dreams of those two wielding flaming swords, right? Yeah, Tommen should have it. Exactly right. Yes, King Arthur Pendragon, which means head dragon. Yes, there's... We talked about that um, in the Great Empire of the Dawn Westeros video because the founder of House Hightower is Uthor Hightower. And there's a bunch of clues about the Hightowers being dragon people. And then his name is Uthor. So it's like, yeah, he's named after Uthor Pendragon. <laughs> Uther Pendragon. They changed the, the one vowel. So King Arthur is a dragon lord in a sense. Elric of Melnibene is a dragon lord. And uh, there you go. Melnibene also exceedingly arrogant. Like <clears throat> the story opens with Elric basically pondering the arrogance of the Melnibene in court. He's like the 400th something emperor of Melnibene. They've been around for 10,000 years. <clears throat> it's kind of like if Valeria had withdrawn from the world and stopped enslaving people and just sort of hunkered down in Valeria and did a whole bunch of drugs and just sort of tuned out. That's essentially what Mel Nibine is like. And it says at one point that Elric, if he wanted to, could take his dragons and the Mel Nibine fleet and reconquer the world like Mel Nibine used to run the world. But he just kind of isn't interested in it. So, <clears throat> Let's see here. I'm going to go back for a couple super chats that I may have missed. See them in the dock, but I cannot highlight them anymore. Okay, so there's one that I can from Smith Crazy. Hey man, enjoy your content. And I truly hope you figure a bunch of this out. Would you be happier or sadder if you were all correct? Well, I'd obviously be very happy. <clears throat> um, I I do think that I'm right about a lot of this stuff, at least to some extent. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting your time. I'm not like making bad faith theory videos just to be entertaining. I Every theory that I put out, I think there's something to it, you know? So, <clears throat> of course, th the way that symbolism can manifest into the story can work out a bunch of different ways, but I'm pretty sure the long night's going to be caused by moon meteors, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have a bunch of zombie watchmen, and gosh, what other stuff have I predicted? Um, all, all kinds of shit. <laughs> yes, I'm right about everything. And if I'm wrong, I'm just going to delete my channel and disappear. No, I'm kidding. I'll be around to talk about how I was wrong and what really happened and what I was thinking, and we'll make sense of it. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Henbot pipes up about the killing frenzy stuff from Irish Myth. It's also been called warp spasm and actually alters physical appearance into a hideous um, and transforms the character into some messed up thing. So, yeah, Elric's face does that too. There's a scene where Simril looks upon his face and he looks like a terrible demon 
for a moment. So when Elric broods and thinks about thing, his his face does transform. And also when he wields the sword, yeah, he, he kind of totally changes. Yeah, we'll make some LML was right t-shirts if the moon meteors come. We'll we'll do something. I'm definitely gonna make a big fucking deal out of it. <laughs> And of course, if you haven't watched the um, the stream called Blood Moon, uh, Blood Moon Leaks Confirm My Theories, uh, one of the HBO spinoff shows that was canceled was called Blood Moon, and it was going to be set in the time of the Long Night, and it was going to involve the events of the Long Night. And the leak that I got from an extra who worked on the show, who I know personally and is extremely credible, told me that... A couple of my theories seem to have been played out in this show. And of course, they consulted with George for the show. So when we see green man priests playing the role of maesters, essentially advising all of the high lords of the land, uh, it sounds like the green men that I've been talking about on the Isle of Faces. And of course, the long when the long night fell, there was a Stark prince and it was a casterly princess that were consummating their marriage at the moment that this eclipse happens and there's this blood moon and that's the name of the show so there's some sort of sacred sex act which which lines up with some sort of celestial moon apocalypse that causes the long night so we didn't get moon meteors in that one but she had just she hadn't seen the whole script either she was basically telling me things that they had been discussing about what was going to happen so there was some sort of astronomical alignment, some sort of eclipse going on, some some sort of moon thing involved in the cause of the long night. So I definitely think that I'm not crazy and uh, that I'm not hallucinating all this stuff. We will see some sort of celestial apocalypse involving the moon at the end of Winds of Winter to kick off the new long night. I'm definitely planting my flag there. So um, Henbot also says that in Irish myth, there is a sacred sword that seems to be thought of as an influence on the Excalibur mythology. It's called the Sword of Light or the... Oh man, I, Irish words are the worst to pronounce. I'll, I'll just put it in the chat here. But that's the name of the sword. And I'll look it up real quick and see what it says. Oh, it's also an Irish nationalist newspaper. It was named after the Sword of Light. Let's see. It is a trope object that appears in a number of Irish and Scottish folk tales. The quest for the Sword of Light formula is cataloged as a motif. I see. The sword appears commonly as a quest object, um, which culminates in the discovery of Uh, there's something about a werewolf here. Uh, let's see. It has been regarded as a legacy to the god-slaying weapons of Irish mythology by certain scholars. Uh, the analogs being the primeval Celtic deity's lightning weapon, Lug's sling, that felled Baylor. The hero, Kukul uh, Kukulain's, I think I'm saying that right, supernatural spear, Gay Bulga, and his shining sword, Graydon. Graydon, catch, ah, man, I wish I could say, I wish I could say these names. I'm sorry, but Irish words don't look anything at all like there's pronounced. <laughs> Kukulain is the, is the character. All right. Well, <clears throat> So it doesn't say a lot about it here, except for that it is a sword of light and a lot of people seek after it. Um, although, of course, we talked about Baylor of the Evil Eye and Lug in the Blood of the Other series, I believe it was. There's also something called the Spear of Longinus that I did some research on, the Spear of Destiny. This was supposedly the spear that uh, stabbed Christ in the side to make sure he was dead. 
and the Roman soldier's name was Longinus. The blood ran down the spear, splashed on Longinus and healed his blind eye. Longinus became converted, later was canonized as a saint. And this spear is, is, is the, one of the only holy relics associated with Christ. Supposedly they found the nails and, uh, and the crown of thorns, but the spear is the real thing um, that everyone wanted. And there's a whole long story about the spear. It gets discovered and rediscovered and it's tied into the grail quest. Charlemagne carries it. It then transfers into German history and Hitler's all obsessed with it. And there's a few different copies. The spear point breaks and the, the point is put on another spear and the original spear is kept in Constantinople. And like, there's a whole thing. So, Check out a couple of YouTube videos on the Spear of Longinus if you want. But the main thing is that it's a holy relic that is looked at as being the difference. Like if an army can find it, they'll win the battle that they shouldn't have won. It gives everyone courage. It's got magical properties. So yeah, it's, it's tied up in the, it was used as part of the motivation for the original crusaders, you know, recovering the spear. So we don't see a ton of that in A Song of Ice and Fire, but we do see it with a little bit with the sword Blackfire. Like Damon Blackfire is seen as legitimate because he has the sword. So these swords are important talismans as far as they legitimize someone of, for divine rule. And we're gonna see Fagon turn up with Blackfire and that's gonna bolster his claim to be, you know, a real king or something like that. We'll see. Although to me, it would make me suspicious that he's a Blackfire. <laughs> we'll see how they navigate that. Oh, I'm Rhaegar's son. I just totally happened to go over to Essos and, you know, get Blackfire back from the Blackfires. Don't ask any questions. So. So, yeah, it's said that an army led by someone with that spear cannot be defeated in battle. So this could be a little bit of an influence on Dragonsteel and Lightbringer and stuff like that. But just want to mention that as an aside. And I am wearing my, my Sun Spear t-shirt. Of course, the Sun Spear is a big moon meteor symbol. Um, <clears throat> and this is an, a call out to Odin, the idea that the sun is transfixed with the spear. So the spear belongs to the sun. It's a sun spear. And the idea is that the word sun spear refers to the way that the sun's rays can beat down in the desert and kill you. So the spears are the sun rays, but we see here, the sun is impaled by its own spear. That is Odin, of course, who is impaled by his own spear, Gungnir on Yggdrasil, so both an Odin reference and a Moon Media reference in the Doran Sigil. Hmm. Oh, and look, it's 420. I've used all my Elric art. Uh, let me find, oh, I got something for you. I'll pull up this picture of Aegon the Conqueror that I used for the cover of the stream, or at least half of it. This is from the new calendar, all the arts by Aronsta Sesteo, who is amazing. Her work is just phenomenal. I, some of my favorite a Song of Ice and Fire depictions. Let me blow this up a bit, make it wider. So there's Aegon on the throne, still freshly forged. And you could see Balerion the Black Dread up in the sky. So one second as I worship Garth. Now, when we talk about cursed swords, I, I flashed, <coughs> excuse me, a picture up in the video 
Uh, so, okay, I'm sorry. I see um, people asking if uh, if there's a Visenya from this artist. There is not. But I do have some sick Visenya art to show you since you asked and since Visenya is awesome. I've got at least five. Yes. I do love showing off art here, so hopefully you guys are all down with that and don't see that as off topic or a distraction or dead air time or anything like that. I know a lot of you guys come to my, enjoy my videos for the art. So I'm assuming that is a okay. This one is by Sarah Christina and definitely a little more like, again, anime style. Uh, the swords got, you know, a little more doohickeys on it than the Valerian steel swords probably did, but super fucking awesome. Anyways, definitely got the Visenya energy. Love the hair, purple cape. Sick. Then we have Bella Bergoltz, who does these awesome haunting portraits of, of characters. That's what she's known for. So here we see the sternness, oops, sorry, and the seriousness of Visenya's gaze. This is a woman not to mess with. This is a woman who has peered into the sorceress arts to find solutions for her problems. This is someone who actually did more conquering than Aegon. She... Aegon was dead, and she was still putting down rebellions with Magor the Cruel. They ought to talk about Visenya the Conqueror, quite frankly. So, yes, Visenya is an awesome character. I want to do a, a Visenya character stream very soon, in fact. Um, I, I'm not done with those character streams. I switched over to doing some of the reread, the read-alongs uh, because I was moving last month. I just didn't have time to do the whole reading Rhaegar character study stuff. But we're not done with those by any means. So, Visenya definitely coming up soon. This is by Pro Crick. Pro Crick's got his own specific style. It's not exactly completely real. It's a little bit surreal. Uh, very cool. Um, and yeah, this is another wicked, badass Visenya. Love the dragon as Vagar, obviously, behind her. And many dead people. Because Visenya did kill a lot of people. And then she's got Dark Sister. Let's zoom in on Dark Sister there. That's looking pretty fucking cool. Oh, yeah. He's got the red and black swirls. Dark Sister should just be a black blade, but I don't mind it having some red. It looks basically like Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale should look. So that's Pro Crick. This one is called Fire is Power by Elena Stripe. And she really should have a helmet on, but that's okay. Um, sort of a Valkyrie looking Visenya here, isn't it? Uh, with the braid. Yeah, definitely, definitely a cool Valkyrie look. And Visenya is a Night's Queen character, as I talked about last night. So she definitely is parallel to people like Val, Lyanna, other, you know, warrior women. Um, so love this one. Uh, and this is kind of the crown jewel here. This is um, Birkin Ozkin. And holy crap. <laughs> I'll zoom in on this and scroll up and down a little bit. So we see the armor. Again. Dark Sister, very cool looking. It's about the right size. It's a very accurate Dark Sister. Visenya, just like, who wants some? Who wants to test me? Who wants to contest our rules? Step on up, son. Love it. And there's Vigar toasting some shit. So, yeah. Like I said, as soon as somebody said Visenya art, I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I got some of that. <laughs> so... All right, what were we talking about? Cursed Swords. Um, oh, yes. So Valerian Steel Swords, potentially cursed, right? And we talked about how Turin took his own life. Um, and same with Calaire Vo. Uh, Ned was killed by his own sword, right? I, I showed a couple of pictures of that in the Nightbringer video. But that definitely reminded me of these cursed swords. Like, it's pretty tragic. He didn't kill himself with his own sword, but he was beheaded by his own sword after he had made a deal to be sent to the wall. So it was a treacherous beheading. It's very tragic. Then Ilan Payne doesn't clean the blood off the blade. And this is sort of a symbolic, magical thinking that George is doing here. He shows us that Ilan Payne has ice and he hasn't cleaned the blood off, Sansa observes. Then later, the sword gets turned into Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, 
whose blades are stained partially red. So now it wasn't Ned's blood on the sword, I don't think, that messed with the coloring that Tobo was trying to do. I don't think that's the case. I do think that George wants us to think about Ned's blood on the sword having consecrated it, though. He's he's a Nissa Nissa-like sacrificial victim putting his blood on the sword, and then it comes out as these red swords that look like Lightbringer. Uh, so if you want to think about Ned's blood going into Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper, you can. All I'm saying is it's more of a magical thinking type of a thing than a like magical mechanics kind of thing. It's We're not supposed to think about the physical properties of blood messing with the coloring of the steel, but on a magical sense, Ned's sacrifice went into ice and then ice was turned into these red blades. It's supposed to be a parallel to Nissa Nissa and Lightbringer, obviously. Lightbringer was white hot from the forge, went into Nissa's heart, it came out red after that. So it's kind of like, you know, after Ned, Ned's blood is on ice, then it turns into these red swords. So <clears throat> pretty cool. And of course, I've talked about the fact that ice is a perfect symbol of the comet. Um, it's actually even more than you think. So comets are made of frozen rock and dirt. That's everyone knows that. The thing is that 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 ball of frozen rock and dirt, as it's hurling through space, um, this black oily tar develops on the outside of the comet nucleus, and it's it's called um, like space go or some space goo or something like that. Um, I want to look this up and get it right. Basically, comets are oily black stones. This is what I learned. <laughs> they literally are. Um, let me see if I can get a description of this. Uh, let's see. The very black material on the surface is carbon-based material similar to the greasy black goo that burns onto your barbecue grill. The comet originally forms from ice, mostly water ice, silicate dust, like powdered beach sand, and this type of black space gunk. So yeah, black space gunk. That's literally what they call it. So a comet looks like a dragon or a flaming sword, but is actually cold. It's a piece of ice but it's also an oily black stone. <laughs> so like, it's just, ah! you can see all the permutations here of Lightbringer things, oily black stone, a black sword named ice. Comets literally are black swords that are ice. So it's, it just goes on and on and on. Gotta love George Martin, you know, grabbing from science in order to sort of make fantasy stuff. Oh, this tea is perfect now. Space resin, yes, it's bong resin. When you talk about the char on the grill, it's basically bong resin, yeah. <clears throat> if your space gunk is black, you should see your general practitioner, Minty says. Uh, yeah. Um, so, there you go. Uh, the ice is definitely a perfect analog for the comet. Um, and, and, of course, Arya compares it to the comet, so... Um, so last night, guys, I read a bunch of moon meteor symbolism quotes that I didn't use in the Nightbringer video. Um, you know, last night was more focused on the meteors, so that went more with last night's quote. However, um, oh, weren't we going to go through Valerian Steel sword names or something like half an hour ago? Ah, <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, so let's do the Valerian Steel sword names in a second. First, I just want to tell you, I'm not even going to read the quote. But Araya Targaryen from Fire and Blood. You guys remember this story. It's the most memorable and horrific thing in Fire and Blood. The poor girl flies on the black on the back of Balerion, the Black Dread, probably to Valyria, but maybe to Sothorios. I think Valyria. That's what is, is his thought. She comes back with some sort of weird worm parasite, and she's fevered and burning from the inside. 
and it just gets worse and worse. And the maester can see things wriggling under her skin and her skin is blackening and like pork crackling, it's said. And then finally the things burst out of her like aliens from, you know, the movie aliens like xenomorphs. And they're killed by putting her in a tub of ice water. In fact, I think it's when they put her in the tub of ice water that the things come out of her essentially. Um, it's, it's total nightmare fuel. But the point is, it's also mythical astronomy. Araya would be the moon that gave birth to dragons. She's literally full of worms, okay? And then she cooks and burns up, bursts open, and then all of these dragon worms come out. So it's perfect moon explosion, moon giving birth to dragon symbolism. It's a parallel to the quote about King Robert from the Mad Prophet, who's like pointing at the comet. He's like, behold the harbinger. And then he says, you know, you know, the king was rotten. And when the boar did open him, a thousand worms spewed out of his belly. So it's the same thing where Robert is playing the moon role. It's being sacrificed by the black boar, the devil boar sent by the gods. That's your, that's your comet. Opens his gut and all the worms come out. So same thing uh, as uh, Araya symbolism there. So it's very disgusting moon meteor symbolism. And I wanted to make sure that we didn't skip that. Now let us go through our Valerian steel swords and ponder the symbolism of their names. I mentioned that Valerian steel is always called smoke dark. So we've got these black meteor sword symbols and they're smoke dark. So that's a clue about the darkness of the long night coming from smoke of meteor impacts. That's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but it goes much further. We talked about how, obviously, ice is a perfect name for the comet. I've talked extensively about Widow's Whale and how Nissa Nissa's cry, her whale, supposedly broke the moon, but really it was a dragon comet that broke the moon. It looked like a sword. And then we have a dragon sword named after a woman's cry, Widow's Whale. So it's combining both the idea of a scream and a comet in one object. That's the moon breaking object. Dragon binder also sounds like a woman's scream and is compared to a, a shivering hot scream, you know, a sword that split, splits the air like a sword thrust. That's the line. So dragon binder is both a sword and a scream. So there's that's widow's whale is very heavy on the long night symbolism, but let's consider the other sword names. I mentioned a black fire. Blackfire obviously draws its name from the Blackfire of the Black Dragons and going further back uh, from uh, Elric Stormbringer, obviously. Which, um, you know, it was described as Black Radiance in the scene we read. It's, it's Blackfire in other places. Oh, Paul, you got to go back. We spent 45 minutes on Stormbringer and Mornblade, my friend. I read some Elric too, so you're definitely going to enjoy rewatching the beginning of the stream. <clears throat> so, uh, so the sword Blackfire, obviously mostly an Elric reference. However, if you want to think about these meteors as dragons, they brought the darkness. They were fire-breathing dragons and flaming meteors, but they brought the darkness. So George does a lot of inversion um, he talks about shadow fire in Danny's vision, and then he talks about black fire. And I think both of these concepts are referring to the idea of fire that burned the world, but then made everything dark. Um, and that's like the furthest you have to reach on any of these sword names. The rest of them are even more obvious. <clears throat> so Heartsbane is the sword of House Tarly. Well, Lightbringer was forged in Nissa Nissa's heart. So Lightbringer is the bane of Nissanissa's heart. Also, the fallen meteors are called the hearts of fallen stars. Nissanissa is analogous to the moon. So the Lightbringer comet is the bane of the heart of the moon. So heart's bane, that's easy. Joffrey also had a sword called Heart Eater, which is the same idea. It's a lion's head eating a heart. The lion is the sun, so it kind of ate the moon by killing it with a comet. Um, 
Also, you could see the eclipse alignment as the moon in the jaws of the sun bites down, gets more than it paid for, and everybody dies. Lady Forlorn. Well, that's <laughs> that's Nissa Nissa. And of course, again, Nissa Nissa is analogous to the moon. The moon turns into the moon meteor swords. The black and, and Valerian swords, by the way, guys, the secret ingredient in Valerian steel could be oily black stone or black meteorite, or those could be the same thing. Um, I definitely think that's possible. The Valerians established a slave, or not established, they took over a slave colony at Gorgai, which they renamed Gogassos. And that is right next to the Isle of Toads, which has the oily black stone monument. So it could be, could be that the Valerians, we don't know when they started making Valerian steel. It could be that they didn't start making Valerian steel until after they mined the oily black stone from the Isle of Toads while they were on Gagasos performing blood magic with all their slaves and their animals and things like that. So I do think human sacrifice is involved, Mike, but I don't think that's the secret ingredient because the Kohorik smiths have been trying to recreate Valerian steel and Kohor loves human sacrifice. So there's even rumors that, that uh, Maester caught them sacrificing babies trying to make Valerian steel. So that's not the missing ingredient. It's definitely an ingredient, but it's not the one that's missing because people have tried that. So it could be Moon Meteor Stone. In any case, Lady Forlorn, that would be Nissa Nissa, or it would be the moon as, as the forlorn moon goddess that's turned into these black meteors. Also references um, when, like I said, when Lin, when Lynn Corbray says, oh, when the lady's got a thirst, when she comes out, she's got to have a sip of the red. It's tying out to the Muramasa swords and Stormbringer and all that stuff. <clears throat> Longclaw, that's an easy one. If the comet is a dragon, then we can see it cracking the moon as clawing the moon with its long claw, right? We see the, the, the spiky iron battlements of the Hammerhorn Keep on the Iron Islands clawing at the face of the moon so these idea of steel claws you know the the wolves when they think about swords and spears they call them teeth and claws they're saying the humans have these iron claws they have the the hard teeth so swords are definitely claws the the comet is a dragon dragons have claws so a long claw that's the comet <clears throat> nightfall the ancestral blade of House Harlaw kind of speaks for itself. I've talked about that a bunch of times. A black sword that brings nightfall. It's a very straightforward clue. And it has a moonstone in its pommel. So now real moonstones are like whitish blue. Definitely make you think of like otherish magic. However, if you just think about the idea of the moon, which used to be Oh, I'm out of juice. It won't glow. Anyways, the moon used to be whole and intact. But then it got turned into a bunch of moonstones when it got cracked open. Those moonstones were like dragons and swords, and they brought the nightfall of the long night. So now we see a black sword called nightfall with a moonstone in its pommel. Guys, if you if you don't think moon meteor theory is true, I don't I don't know what to tell you, man. There's a lot more evidence for it than RLJ, <laughs> quite frankly. And I believe RLJ is settled law, <clears throat> as they say. Uh, then there's another ironborn sword, Red Rain, the sword of House Drum. Um, it's possible that it's thought to be a red sword, but it's not explicitly stated that it's a red sword. It's called Red Rain, so one imagines that it might be. Um uh, some people wonder if it's the ancestral sword of House Rain, uh, as in the reigns of Castamir Rain. That could be. Um, there's a line when Jory Cassell and Ned are fighting the Lannisters in King's Landing where it's uh, it's it's raining as they're fighting. And there's um, when the water flings from Jory's sword, it's like a red rain. So the red rain is is kind of tied into the idea of swords and Valerian swords and this sort of reign of blood idea. And of course, the bleeding stars are the reign of blood. So that's the red rain. It's the same as the storm of swords. <clears throat> In 
And uh, I've got the Storm of Swords quote. I read it last night, but let me pull it up. I'll read it again. <clears throat> Storm of Swords is the name of a book, but it's also a meteor symbol that George uses in an Aria chapter. Here the quote goes like this. When they reached the top of the ridge and saw the river, Sandor Clegane rained up hard and cursed. The rain was falling from a black iron sky, pricking the green and brown torrent with 10,000 swords. So the rain is like swords and it's falling from a black iron sky. So a black sky, darkness of the long night, black iron sword rain. That's the storm of swords, if you will. That's the meteor shower. So George literally named one of his books after the meteor shower, then gave us a mythical symbolism to let us know that the Storm of Swords is the meteor shower. So pretty cool. And he also set it up in the Game of Thrones prologue when Waymar's sword breaks and it's like a rain of needles, the sword shards. And of course, Arya's sword is called needle. So it's, they're both broken pieces of sword and little swords themselves. One of them hits Waymar in the eye. His eye is like the moon. I've talked about this before. So that's Red Rain. Red Rain is definitely a great long night sword name. 10 out of 10. Cleo, messing with my stream, girl. <laughs> Oathkeeper. This one's less obvious, but one day the other moon will kiss the sun too, and it will crack and the dragons will return. So there is a prophecy of a second moon cracking disaster right in the Carthine legend of the moon cracking to birth dragons, which I always talk about. That's going to be the comet that returns to break the other moon and cause the new long night. So in that sense, the comet will come back and keep its promise. The comet is the oath keeper and the oath is to kill the other moon. I'm always upstaged by birds here. That's part of the game. Then we have... Um, let's see. Bright Roar, the lost ancestral sword of House Lannister. That kind of goes without explanation. Bright Roar, big explosion, big sound. Of course, there's no sound in space. But when those moon meteors came to Earth, you better believe there was some sound. It would have been sonic booms, thunderclaps. The whole sky would have been on fire. So that's Bright Roar. The sound and the picture of the long night. Um, Dark Sister. My friends, if you have two moons and one goes dark, that's the Dark Sister. That's the one that gave us the sword meteors. So pretty, pretty straight on there. Another two moons clue, by the way, is uh, Nissa Nissa's name being repeated. She's analogous to the second moon. Her name is Nissa Nissa. So moon moon, if you will. <clears throat> And then we've got Lamentation, the ancestral sword of House Royce. Well, Lamentation, that's crying, sorrow. And Azor Ahai, Azor Ahai supposedly, was his heart was heavy with sorrow, for he knew what he must do, right? And then Nissa Nissa cries out with agony and ecstasy when the Lightbringers, you know, stabs her. So Lamentation, the entire Lightbringer forging mythology is a Lamentation. Orphan Maker. Well, those moon meteor dragons, they're the children of the moon. The moon is the mother of dragons, just as Danny is the mother of dragons. But after the moon breaks, the mother is gone. So the dragons are orphans. So the comet made them orphans. The comet is the orphan maker. Sorry, I don't make the rules. That's just how it works. <clears throat> yeah, the moon died in childbirth. Exactly right. And that's why we see uh, Leanna and um, Rayella and uh, Tyrion's mother, Joanna Lannister. No, not Joanna. What's what's the what's Jamie and Cersei's mother's name? Bad Lannister knowledge. Sorry. <clears throat> And yeah, the chat is bumping. Thank you, chat. 
Yes, people have wondered if Nissa and Misa might share etymology. That makes sense to me. They're pretty close. Um, and also there's that tradition in Karth of leaving one one breast bare. Well, of course, Azor High said to Nissa, Nissa, bare your breast. I know that I love you best in all this world. So I've definitely thought that the one bare breast is is a call out to Nissa Nissa's memory. And remember, the, the, the moon dragon myth is from Karth. I believe that places in the east are going to have more mythology about Azor High, more and more clear, you know, echoes of the great empire. Karth is one of those places. <clears throat> Karth and Slaver's Bay. So, yeah, Misa, Misa could be a, a phonetic derivative, uh, the party tit. Yeah, exactly. That's the party tit. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Misa, Misa, Nissa, Nissa definitely could be. Do we ever get, uh, it is Joanna. Okay. Sorry. I was wrong. Karen Lannister. <laughs> Isn't Catelyn more of a Karen? Oh gosh. I actually like Catelyn. I don't mean to start the Catelyn hate, but didn't she stand up and like cancel Tyrion in the end, like made everybody arrest him? This dwarf killed my son. That's not exactly a Karen move, but anyways. <clears throat> All right. And yes, we've, we talked about the moon boob symbolism in the Brienne stream also. Tits of ice and fire. That's a thing. Uh, let's see, there's a Valerian steel sword called Truth, carried by Morito Roguer of Lys. That one, I don't have anything for you. Truth. I mean, that's so relative. Quaithe always talks about there being truth in a shy, and that truth can have something to do with Azor High. So, I don't know. That's just... Pfft kind of vague vigilance same thing ancestral sort of house high tower its last owner was ormond high tower um vigilance i think that's a thing about like watching the stars watching for this comet to return but again that's a little bit more like you know you could make that mean anything so but most of them are pretty explicit especially like nightfall red rain ice widow's whale Long claw, bright roar, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there you go. Here's your Valerian steel swords. Let's not start bagging on the Tullys. They have squisher symbolism at the very least. They wear they wear suits of armor that make them look like fish people, like Oans or Dagon. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, Blackfish doesn't suck. Blackfish is awesome. He has an obsidian fish brooch, which is like a sea dragon. Think about it. <clears throat> Let's see here. Cool. Well, uh, go ahead and take last call for questions. We're at an hour and 48 minutes, so uh, oh, time flies. <clears throat> no, I, I don't have thoughts on Kermit and Elmo Tully. That's just George being silly. I don't, I don't know if there's anything else to that. Blackfish will never get married. We know that. Everyone knows that. So that's it. I answered all your Nightbringer questions, guys. You don't have any questions about the moon meteors and the long night. I, I guess I get pretty much locked it down, huh? You guys are just liking liking the show. I it's really not a lot to to wonder about. I think I think I, I think proved it pretty good. How would you explain the impact of Valerian steel on the others? Well, we don't know for sure. I mean, I imagine that it probably does work against the others. I think the thing about Valerian steel is they're the only blades that can handle being lit on fire, probably. Because we see the fire erodes the sword. Barrack's sword breaks. You know, and there's a lot of talk about how Thoros is always ruining his swords with wildfire. So I think a Valerian steel sword is the only one that could stand being lit on fire. And I do think we will have a nice watch with many Valerian, with many flaming swords, not just one. And I'm going to talk about that actually 
in uh in the uh, Melisandre secrets. Thank you, Cinnabarb. Yes, I did have some patron questions from yesterday that I was saving. Thank you for reminding me. I can't see, girl. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So the one and only Cinnabarb <laughs> says, last night's stream was excellent. I'm on board with Euron aiding in starting the new long night. And of course, I talked about that in the... Uh, Knights King Crow's Eye and Euron King of the Apocalypse videos. I'm on board with Euron aiding and starting the new Long Night. Would you agree that it would be best? It would be the best worst case scenario if Euron tag teamed the Apocalypse with whatever entity comes out of the ether. Instead of being forced into a corner of his own mind, I personally think that trope is overused. Another question would be who is seeing the before and after? I don't think Euron will survive. So the only option would be Victarion. Oh, you mean witnessing Euron. Okay, good question. All these are good questions. So the thing we have to remember is that we're not going to be inside Euron's head. So if he becomes Knight's King or has an entity like Knight's Queen or the original Knight's King, Azor High, body snatch him like, like in Aluki um, from Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, or like a Lovecraftian thing, then the thing is we're not going to know how much is Euron and how much is whatever that entity is. We're not even going to know that an entity possessed him for sure. It's just going to look like that. And we'll, we'll be left to figure it out. Maybe, maybe he'll proclaim some shit doing his like evil villain rant or something. But I think that we're not going to know. We're, it's just going to be one of those things where George sort of implies that Euron has been possessed. And it'll be up to us to sort of wonder about it. Because a lot of the Lovecraft stuff is like that. It's kind of implied, but not really drawn into the foreground. <clears throat> so how do you guys like to say Valyrian? I think I say it Valyrian most. Sometimes I say Valerian, but I like Valyrian because the Valerian is a different thing. That's a flower. Um, and Valyrian steel sounds more elven to me. And the, the the Valerians are definitely basically dark elves. So I like to say Valyrian. But George has said you can pronounce his words any way you want to. So if you want to say Brian of Tarth, you can. It's not wrong. What I hate is the people that say Aegon. I hate that. Aegon. It's the worst. It's Aegon, like Sargon, the conqueror, not Aegon. It's the worst. Also hate Daenerys. Daenerys, like Ares, like a like Damocles, like the sword of Damocles. So Eris, King Eris, King Anus. Hate that. It's Anes, not Anus. Anes, Rainies, Aegon. This is what I feel strongly about. <laughs> Aegon and Rhaenys are right out. I can't listen to any podcast that say Aegon or Rhaenys or Daenerys. I like, I just turn right off, dude. I can't. <clears throat> Daenerys. Yeah, that's, that's, it just sounds more like a conqueror, right? And I think that's the idea. Um. <clears throat> Aegon would be the, uh, or Agon would be the Irish pronunciation. Yeah, see, Aegon sex has to be a hard A. Aegon. Viserys, yeah. <laughs> yeah, King King Anus, the one eye. Exactly, that's what you're left with. If you don't say Anes, then you're basically saying Anus, King Anus. And I, I don't think that's the, that's the idea. <laughs> well, maybe it is, I don't know. <clears throat> All right, you guys are having fun. <laughs> don't be offended if you say it differently than how I say it. I'm just trying to be entertaining here. I don't really care. <laughs> but I do think it's Daenerys. 
All right, friends. So like I said, oh, oh, there's one more patron, I think. Yes, there was one I saved. Let me see. Based on what you've covered from Elric and the Silmarillion, the twin swords seem to oppose each other more than complement or cooperate. Although later Elric does give Mornblade to his friend and they both, they, they do wield him in concert. Um, however, you're, you're right. They mostly do oppose each other. So with that in mind, it seems like either Widow's Wail or Dawn um, or Dawn's twin or opposite will end up in Euron's possession. So Euron has Valerian armor and a dragon binder horn. Pulling out a Valerian steel sword would almost be like par for the course. It wouldn't be surprising at all. Um, I'm not sure how we'd get his hands on Widow's Whale. He'd have to take King's Landing. We're a long way from that. And I think Dawn is going to be in Darkstar's hands and end up with Fagon and also in King's Landing. However, Bright Roar is the one I wonder about. If he's been to Valeria and recovered Valerian armor, could he have recovered the Lannister sword Bright Roar? That could be. There's also a couple of Valerian swords among the Ironborn, Nightfall and Red Rain. So I think Euron would look the best with Nightfall because the Moonstone would match his blue eye and then the Black Sword would match his black blood eye. So... It's actually pronounced McQueen. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, so I do. So will we see swords? Uh, we see Brienne and Jamie having the twin flaming swords, and they're fighting together. Um, right now, Oathkeeper is in the cave, and Widow's Well is in King's Landing. So I think it's more likely that those two will be used together, It'll be Jamie and Brienne wielding those two swords. Um, I don't, we did have a, we did have a clash between Valerian steel swords when Damon Blackfire fought one of the Corbrays who was a Kingsguard. So that's cool because you've got a white otherish character, the Kingsguard with Lady Forlorn fighting Damon Blackfire with Blackfire. Um, it's also said that uh, um, Ulrich Dane, the Sword of the Morning, uh, Damon Blackfire was even better than him. So it's they didn't fight, but it's almost implied you could see a guy with the Sword of the Morning fighting Damon Blackfire, which would be awesome. So I want to see, I want to see John with Dawn fighting Fagon with Blackfire. There you go. That's what I want. And I haven't watched Avatar The Last Airbender, but I'm going to. I know there is also Azor High type stuff going on in there as well. But guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this stream up. We're just under two hours. So thank you, everyone who's watched. Leave a comment on your way out if there's any sword mythology that you think figures into Lightbringer that I missed. Pipe up and let me know. And I will see you again. I'm going to start doing the uh, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday thing again. So I will see you Wednesday at 3 I think I'm going to read. Uh, which chapter was I going to read? Um, it's one that complements all this stuff really well. What was it? I don't know. Just come watch. Come to my stream. I'll be reading A Song of Ice and Fire. Three o'clock Pacific time on Wednesday. Friday at midnight Pacific time. And then Sunday at three again. So Wednesday at three. Friday midnight, Sunday at 3. That's going to be the schedule from now on. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time.